Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. I'm Hanovi Schoonover, the Training and Resource Coordinator at Redmond Consulting, and I'll be the host for this call. Today we will be covering Tribal Transitional Housing Program, the four key components. We are joined today with Victoria Bonas, who is the Executive Director of Redwood Consulting. Uh, Victoria is Navajo and part of the Apache uh, Nation as well. And she's been working to end violence against American Indians and Alaskan Native women for over 30 years. She developed and is the Executive Director of Redwood Consulting, as I mentioned before, from 2005 to present day. Uh, and she has been coordinating and providing tribal technical assistance for recipients of the Tribal Governments Program for the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women. Current programs include the development and implementation of tribal-specific shelter and transitional housing programs and assisting tribal programs in development and program delivery, along with addressing children impacted by violence against Indian women and teen dating violence. She developed Redwind's National Tribal Advocate Center, providing 40 hours of domestic violence training and 40 hours of sexual assault training. She also developed the curriculum for each training and serves as lead faculty. And I will now turn the call over to her. Thank you, Hanavi. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our call today. Um, I wanted to take some time to um, share with you information about Tribal Transitional Housing Program components um, as a part of helping um, helping for grantee pro um, programs to understand the key aspects of what uh, a transitional housing program um, should and can include. And um, over the course of um, this webinar, I'll stop um, a couple times to um, See if you've got any questions, and if you've got any questions also, you can just raise your hand and we'll keep an eye out for it and try to catch that as well. Um, so um, to get started, I just wanted to just touch briefly about um, the intersection of domestic violence and sexual violence with homelessness, because when we, when we think about that and why um, transitional housing is so important, it has to do with that intersection between domestic violence, sexual violence, and homelessness. And so what we know is that the experience with domestic violence and or sexual violence really contributes to chronic homelessness, and that 92% of homeless women have experienced severe physical or sexual abuse in their lives. And domestic violence itself is a leading cause of homelessness for women and children. Um, you know, there's an estimated 40% of family homelessness that's contributed to domestic violence. And homeless women may seek um, the perceived safety of a new partner and become the victim of coercive control. And so we under, we all, you know, many of us understand the dynamics of domestic violence and sexual violence. And it's important for us to recognize that homelessness in itself is another um, intersecting aspect of that violence and the natures of power and control. And, um, and it actually lays the foundation for why transitional housing programs are so important for um, our response to addressing violence against our indigenous women and their children. Um, so I wanted to talk just briefly about um, the difference between shelter, transitional housing, and permanent housing. In my work with uh, different programs over the years, one of the things that I have seen is that we use some language that often kind of muddies up the water, so sometimes we're using some language that is describing transitional housing, but it, but we're actually meeting and talking about shelter um, or vice versa. So an emergency shelter response, we're basically talking about um, the short-term response, so it tends to be a few days to a few months, and that depends on how the program's developed, and it ranges, usually the, the standard is 30 days, and then many programs will do extensions up to two or three months. 
and it's a crisis response. So when we think about the advocacy in there, it's about dealing with that immediately, immediate crisis when people are fleeing um, from the immediate violence. Um, transitional housing, on the other hand, tends to be um, a longer-term response, and it's really about um, creating an environment where uh, the survivor and their household, um, their children that are living with them, can stabilize themselves as a result of the impact of the violence that they've lived with. And transitional housing statutorily requires a minimum of a six-month program up to a maximum of 24 months. And each of the tribes that are getting funded for transitional housing, they can define their maximum length of program but cannot define the minimum um, because this, the, the law actually that provides the resources through OVW um, defines it as a minimum of six months. Um, so many of the programs that I've worked with um, tend to define it um, nine months a year up to 18 months. I, I've rarely seen the 24 months just because of how, um, you know, how, how to manage all the resources to make all that work. Um, but what we do know is that the longer a person can stay in the transitional housing and receive the supportive services, that the, the family and the household is more stabilized. So ideally, we would want to see the longer end then over the shorter end. And then the activities, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about within this webinar, um, but we're talking about continued advocacy, and there may still be some, some advocacy that's still engaged with some of that crisis response as a result of having reported to the police department, um, and having follow-up medical care, those kinds of things, um, but then also engaged in helping looking at, at housing um, for the long term towards permanent housing and different supportive services to help stabilize that household. Um, and permanent housing is that long-term stability. So it's basically where you're going to have housing where you expect you can stay there as long as you want to stay as long as you can afford um, the ability to stay there. Um, so there's no length of, t of stay deadline, um, no limit to how long you can stay there. Oftentimes if people are renting a unit, then there might be a, a, you know, a, a year to year lease or something like that. And oftentimes permanent housing does not have programming involved, although there might be some exceptions to that depending on some of the resources that um, may be available in your local community. And the goal through transitional housing is to be able to move people into that permanent housing um, situation. So I do want to acknowledge a couple pieces around um, permanent housing in um, transitional housing in, in relationship to um, the way our tribal transitional housing works. Oftentimes, um, we are providing a rental subsidy versus owning a facility and operating, you know, say a, a, an apartment building with 12 units of housing in it. Instead, our tribal programs are providing a rental subsidy for that period of time that the program is defined. So, which actually is really an ideal situation because as that rental subsidy lifts off, ideally you're leaving that person in a situation of permanent housing. So they don't have to move again um, to be able to end up in permanent housing. And as a part of all of that, it means that then you'll want to be really working with that household so that they're able and ready to handle that full rent obligation um, without any subsidy or, or um, financial support um, once that subsidy comes to an end. So also within your transitional housing program, you want to be um, aware of the different populations that you would be serving and how you may end up working different with the different populations. And so because, because we're doing rental subsidies, there should not be a restriction of we only serve women. So usually that ends up being a restriction in a community living situation 
but when you've got a scattered site situation where um, it's not a shared living situation, everybody has their own individual housing, um, there should not be any restriction between whether it's a female, um, male, any gender identity um, differences. So um, it's important to be aware of that, that you can serve all populations and you'll want to serve all populations. And that as you're working with the different populations, you want to recognize that there might be different needs and different approaches. And so in that, one of the key things is, is that wh whoever we're working with, that what's going to work for one person might look different for another person. Um, depending on where they are personally in terms of the impacts of trauma, as well as their readiness to get a job, to um, have, you know, the ability to uh, secure uh, permanent housing or any kind of rental housing. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important for us to recognize are the different forms of oppression that can play out. And what I mean by that is that I know that oftentimes um, we may find communities surrounding our, our tribal lands that may have um, some barriers based on prejudice or racism. And so with the population we're working with, it may be more challenging sometimes to get them into a unit, into an apartment, based on those prejudices that may be playing out. So it puts us in a position of having to figure out how to be more proactive. And as we look across the different populations, we can see that also as we look at our LGBTQ two-spirit relatives, that um, they may also be, be faced with um, resistance to, and attitudes of prejudice um, that can play out as well. And I think it's important for us to do that with our eyes open because if we are making connections um, to housing that's not safe for our population or other resources in the community that's not safe for our populations, then they're, they're going to continue to experience different forms of tra trauma and may in, um, experience more um, you know, more external violence as well as um, things that are destabilizing to their households. Um, the, our disabled, deaf, um, vision impaired populations, also we want to think about the types of units and resources that we're accessing to ensure that they have the kind of support that's needed to, to um, help them move through some of the barriers that they may be faced with. Our elder victims have their own unique challenges that, um, that come with an aging population. Many times when we look at the services that are available, they're available for a younger population, often targeted to a population, you know, moving up toward like 50 years old or something like that. And then, um, uh, then the elder benefits in some instances might not kick in until that person is in their 60s, which then can create a barrier of about a 10-year span where resources may not ne necessarily be re readily available. And so if you think about an elder um, victim who may have their children who are out of the household but not 60 years old, they may not be able to get public assistance and yet may not readily be able to um, get a job. Um, so the ability to find and support them in, in securing income can pose new challenges as well, um, as well as having um, different types of ways that the trauma from the violence plays out for them physically and um, having longer healing periods for themselves as well. So when we think about transitional housing and um, the, the foundation of what it is, is we're really looking at it's a time and, and space for survivors to get on their feet. 
And what I mean by that is that through the violence, there hasn't been much time to think about tomorrow, whether that's tomorrow being the next day or tomorrow being the next few months or even being tomorrow in the next few years. Um, they've been operating in the moment, responding to the challenges that are, that are occurring to them, and transitional housing creates that space to think beyond right now and to start envisioning the life that they want to have for themselves. Having lived with the violence, they've been in a position where um, they haven't even been able to dream, like what if, you know, what would I like to do with my life in the future? Where do I see myself five years from now? What would I like to see happening for my children? And um, transitional housing, um, is that space for us to do that, um, to help engage those participants in a way that help move them forward into beginning to um, consider and imagine their, their possibilities and their futures. And with that, it's a time and space to make decisions. And in making decisions, um, oftentimes living in an abusive relationship they haven't had many choices for decision making. And so sometimes that process of making decisions can be very challenging in, um, in choosing where a person is going to live. Do I, do I pick this apartment or do I pick this house as a place to live? Um, and looking at, you know, is, how does this fit for where my children are going to go to school and my possibilities for transportation and my possibilities for a job. Some of that, all of that decision-making process and some of that coming together at the same time can be overwhelming. So the transitional housing um, staff can be engaged in ways to help, help take the, some of that being overwhelmed away, help, to, help them to manage their decision-making process and to start looking at what is most important to them and figuring out what's going to make the most sense for them. <clears throat> and overall, I think that as a staff person working in transitional housing, I think one of the things that's really important is that um, it's important for us to recognize that it's their decisions, not ours. Um, I don't. I, I know for myself, I've worked in transitional housing for several years over over the years, and I've had many many women that I've worked with say, "Well, what would you do? You know, um, you know, well, just tell me how to make this decision, or tell me what would be best for me." And the reality is, is that would be an easy way to just say, "Yeah, we'll do it this way," or you know, take it, you know, take these steps. Um, but the reality is, is I don't have to live with that. As a staff person, I go home to my own family and my own life, and they're the ones who live with the consequences of the decisions. So they, it has to be their decisions. It has to be their process to come to a place of understanding what's going to make the most sense for them. So we also want to think about it from a survivor-centered, relative-centered approach. And what I mean by that, a lot of people talk about survivor-centered, and um, at Redwind here we talk about relative-centered as well, um, that when we think about it and we look at who we're serving, we are serving our relatives. And we often talk about that we create sister space and um, that we're creating a space for our relatives, that this is a time and space where we can engage with our relatives in a way that's gentle and respectful and yet honest. And um, I know there's people in my life that have talked about, you know, brutal honesty. And I don't think honesty should ever have to be brutal. Um, that as we're communicating with somebody about truth and the harshness of what's happening in their life, we want to take some approaches 
that can be gentle and respectful. And what I mean by that is that some of the conversations we'll have with survivors may be very hard. That being able to sit down and talk to them about what those barriers are and help them to identify what they are and why they're problematic and how to work through that can be, um, it can be almost a shameful experience if it's not done right. People, you know, when you think about it, think about how you would do that approach with your relative, with your sister, with your brother, um, and approach your work from that, that way so that you're talking in a way that um, you're being honest but you're recognizing it, it may be hard for them to hear it. And so with that, mix that with some gentleness and some patience. Because the other thing is, is that through the history of the, their history of living with the violence, whether it was domestic violence or sexual violence, that they, they had some reactions to that and may have had um, a very short-lived experience with that violence or a very long-lived experience with that violence. And as a result of that, has, has um, made it difficult for that decision making um, as a part of the way the tactics of power and control have been used against them. So we want to be very careful and gentle and respectful that these are their decisions to make and yet at the same time that we have information and knowledge that can be helpful for them. So we want to help inform them in ways so that they can begin to see their options and see their choices and then support them in the choices that they make. And that's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something where for myself in working with survivors in transitional housing, it's a process of having multiple conversations. And I know that, um, so for instance, I'll tell you a story about one woman I worked with um, several years ago. And she, ha she was chemically dependent, and she struggled quite a bit with that. And I opened up the conversation with her talking about her drinking, and one of the things I asked her was, has drinking ever interfered with the way you live, with taking care of important business? And she didn't have answers for me, and that was okay. What I wanted to do was to leave her questioning. I didn't necessarily want her to answer and, you know, go through like an interview with her about it. I wanted to have a conversation and leave her questioning, you know, has it interfered with, with my life? Has it interfered with important things? So that she's starting to create markers in her mind so that she can start to see that that's a problem. What we know in working with people with heart issues is that in order for it to be sex successful is that they, want, they have to want to do it. So I could turn around and say, well, you need to do A, B, and C to address your drinking problem and, um, and it won't be successful unless she's ready to do it. And not that she's just verbally saying, yes, I'll do it, but that that person is actually um, saying, I'm ready to look at it. I'm seeing that there is a problem, and I can't live with it anymore. I need to do something different. So that's going to take multiple conversations. So that one woman that I had asked her that question, I had multiple conversations with her about it. And as I would see her get really uncomfortable, I would let it go and we just built on it each time. And then one day I was driving her home from an, from an appointment and she brings up while we're in the car alone and she says, I think I've got a drinking problem. And instead of just saying, well, let's make an appointment and talk about it, I pulled over to the shoulder of the road, I parked the car and I stopped and I asked her, I said, so what, why are you saying that? And so then she started talking about and telling me about what, how, what her decision-making process was or her awareness process was. And then I asked her, so what do you think you need to do? 
And so it was her decision. And she made the choice that she wanted to go and talk to somebody about getting help. And that specific kind of help, because she didn't know really what her options were, um, but she, we, I was able to help her go and talk to somebody from the alcohol and drug program. And then from there, they were able to help her get into treatment and then continued to work with her to help her as she, as she left treatment and worked on her sobriety. That whole process of the discussion and the time of moving her to action probably took about nine, ten months um, from the first time I opened up the conversation. And so in the midst of that, in a survivor-centered, relative-centered approach, is also as a staff person of being really patient through their process, but also being a mirror for them so that they can see um, themselves um, to that reflection of the conversations we're having. So there are some basic guiding principles about transitional housing. And one of the things I've just mentioned and was talking about um, was survivor-centered or relative-centered approach. And that's a critical part um, that it's important for um, autonomy, individual choice. Um, in the process, they make their own decisions. They, make, they look at their, they examine their choices and, and choose from their, their range of options. Um, and then strict confidentiality. And this is an area I see a lot of programs struggle with. And particularly because in our tribal communities, our our transitional housing is located oftentimes within a domestic violence crisis program. And then our domestic violence crisis program is also located through a larger department, and it may be like a department such as the Department of Public Safety, or it might be through behavioral health or um, uh, the Department of Human Services, something like that. And so that, that strict confidentiality is maintained within your transitional housing program. So that means even being housed within a crisis program, that you maintain that confidentiality so that all of the knowledge of what you've got within working with this individual does not leak over to people doing the crisis work. So if you're fortunate in your program and you've got like four staff or six staff or, you know, like something like that, and you've got like one or two working in transitional housing, the information that they get should not be shared with other advocates. Um, it should stay within the transitional housing program. And then between the two transitional housing advocates, it's on a need-to-know basis. So if, you know, one of the things that, that happens in the work is we are privileged and honor to be able to hear the, the most intimate of details of a person's life. Um, we might end up hearing more details about the experience of the violence that played out. Um, some of their fears, some of their deepest fears, and some of their largest joys. And in the midst of all of that, that as somebody else is stepping in to cover because I took a vacation or was out with the flu, they don't need to know those details to do that work. So whatever they're working on, they don't need to have all that information, so the need to know. So if they're working with somebody on employment stuff, it doesn't matter the story of her violence that she, she lived with with her, her former partner or the story of the sexual assault that took place um, when somebody is working on employment. That, that's not necessary. Um, so we really want to understand that, and I, and I think about it in terms of, so within the program itself, on a need-to-know basis, outside of that program where it might cross into the program that our transitional housing program is, is housed in, we want to have walls around that transitional housing program so it doesn't leak out into that cross crisis program. 
And then I've also seen where we've had situations where when my program is housed with, say, for instance, an example would be like in behavioral health, and the Department of Behavioral Health director says, let's do case management, and I know you've got people in your transitional housing program that have alcohol and drug issues, so let's do case management with alcohol and drug or the mental health department. And the reality is, is that is a breach of confidentiality. The only way you can do that is if you have a signed release. And um, I would encourage you as you're, as you're thinking about what you do and how you do it, um, if you'd like to talk more about signed releases and confidentiality and how all that plays out, um, you can contact Redwin and we'll, we'll help you work through some of those challenges. Um, because it, the, 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 the signed release should also be very specific and time limited. So, um, so again, keeping rigid control of the share of information. And it's not just because we want to hoard information. This is about, this is about survivor safety. And that even, even six months or nine months or a year after that relationship, it's still information getting out could still be potentially very dangerous for this, this individual or, and or their household. Um, I, I know over the years with households that I've worked with, one of the biggest risks has been that um, the abusers have, has wanted to kidnap the children. So being able to keep information very contained is really, really critical. Um, which leads into centralizing survivor safety. So as you're doing the work, critical, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're always asking the question, how, can, how will this affect safety? As you're helping to find housing, um, how is this house, how is this apartment safe? Where is it located? How is it physically configured? Um, you know, I often like to think about like even windows close to the door where you, you know, can break a window and reach in and reach the doorknob to unlock it. Um, things like that. So you're, you're thinking about physical safety around the property, the housing. You also want to think about safety in terms of how they're moving about in their lives. And it's not about the advocate doing all the work around safety, but engaging in safety planning in such a way to where that person, that household, develops their ability to um, create their own safety strategies. So we want to think long term because we want to think about doing safety planning in such a way as that when we're no longer in their life, they have all of the tools that they can to be able to consider their options for safety and creating new strategies to keep themselves safe. Um, and then we want to be pa constantly paying attention to the voices of the survivors and, um, and taking into consideration what they're saying they want and what's important to them um, in the process of the way we work. So the key four, four components of safety when we think about that, so or not safety, oh, the key, four key components of transitional housing are safety, recovery from violence, economic advocacy, and housing advocacy. And so um, I just talked a little bit about safety and that we want to do an ongoing process with the victim survivor. We want to do the process in a way that she, that she or he is thinking about their children um, and how that safety carries over to what they need to be doing to keep themselves safe and not sharing information that should not be shared. And then looking at safety within the workplace, safety as they move about the community, um, safety as, the, as um, the children come and go from school, different aspects of their life. Um, and then the recovery from violence component we really want to recognize um, the trauma impact from the violence and, um, and how that affects the way people, um, how they live their lives and help them engage in a process of, of recovery from that trauma, from the impact of that violence. 
that may mean that they um, that they're engaged. They may be engaged in um, traditional ceremonies or cultural activities, but working with a spiritual healer or a traditional practitioner, or they may go a more conventional route, um, working with a, a counselor or a therapist or even some group settings um, to get a better understanding of what happened. Um, uh, oftentimes programs will offer women's educational groups to talk about and understand the dynamics of domestic violence and the impact and dynamics of power and control from sexual violence. And all of those are different kinds of tools that can help that, that individual, that survivor, engage in their process of recovery. And as I had mentioned before, is that each person is going to take a different, different, different path as they're engaged in their own recovery from violence. One person may bounce back really fast, and another person may take a lot, a lot longer than what you would imagine. And so it's important for us to not judge their process and their timeline because it's just that, it's their process and their timeline. And they may also be dealing with other, other things that happen that are not being disclosed to us. So we need to recognize how all of that comes together in their lives. Housing advocacy. So when we think about housing advocacy, um, that has multiple different levels to that. So within housing advocacy, one is we want to help people get into housing and we're going to provide rental subsidies. Um, <clears throat> but the other part in there is that we want to work with them in helping them to sustain long-term housing. So some people may have the ability to in increase their income in such a way to where they're going to be able to support their rent without without subsidy after our subsidy leaves, and other people may not have that capability. Um, and in particular, those, those households who may be on public assistance or fixed income such as Social Security or Social Security disability um, incomes, um, those often won't change very much from year to year. Um, with very, very tiny increases, and um, so when the subsidy gets removed, um, the, the housing cost may, may still seem quite overwhelming for them. So in the process, then, we want to be working with our tribal housing authority, and if, if we're surrounded by other um, towns or communities around us um, that have other housing authorities, we want to work with them as well. <clears throat> and in that process to be able to see if they have um, <clears throat> subsidies that can be um, accessed for the, house, for the household. And so we cannot layer one subsidy over another, um, but what we want to do is plan for when our subsidy is coming to an end that they may be able to access another subsidy to carry them forward. Oftentimes the most common one would be a Section 8. Um, where that they could attach it to the unit that they're already living in, that would allow them to be, be stable. And we know that um, housing authority Section 8 waiting lists tend to be quite long, and sometimes it may take a year, two or three years to get on that list. Um, so we want to work with people to help, help them um, strategize for what's going to, how, how are they going to make it until that time. Um, and that they're very quickly got on that list. So it's not something that halfway through the time that they're in our program that we, we start thinking about it. Just as soon as we get them in to housing, we also want to help them start thinking about, so what, what's going to happen at the end. So we're always looking not only about the immediate next steps, but the long-term steps that are coming down the road so that they don't sneak up on us and surprise us. <clears throat> and then economic advocacy. And this is really a key part in here, um, again, towards long-term self-sufficiency and sustainability. So how to help increase the income in the household. 
So it might be that somebody comes into the household and they have zero income coming in. And in those cases, then, um, then we would help them secure public assistance or, um, and that could be something like TANF or depending on their living, their situation, maybe it's the social security disability income or if it's an elder who hasn't yet um, started social security, um, maybe it's a program such as that um, if they're ready for it. <clears throat> but it also may be other things such as um, helping to get people ready for jobs, um, which could be helping them to look at their education status, um, have they completed high school, um, if they have completed it, then are there certificate programs or um, college programs that they could engage in that may be helpful to um, improve their earning capability? And um, if they haven't completed high school, then even looking at a GED program to support them in getting their GED so that they can maybe move on to um, higher earning capability through the GED or engaging in a certificate program or a college program after that. So one of the things that's really helpful with that is the partnership with your um, job um, jobs and training department um, through the tribe. And if, if you don't have one through the tribe, um, looking into the local community to see what they have um, and accessing that. And oftentimes, there's a range of different programs that might be in the surrounding communities as well if the tribe doesn't have some of those resources. And when you're working with them, then um, you can actually build relationships in ways to help, um, ha help you have a stronger understanding of what they can and cannot do so that when you're helping to get them hooked up with those services, that it's a really good connection and not one that's going to frustrate everybody in the long run. So for instance, one, one woman I worked with, um, well actually several women I worked with had chemical dependency problems. <clears throat> and we had a jobs and training um, person that actually was really good at working with the gap in earning capacity based on their alcoholism. And so um, I had no idea, but I had gone over to their office the one day, made an appointment ahead of time, went over there to take just a half hour, 45 minutes to sit down and learn about what they do and bring information about our program so they understood what we did. And the, the um, worker was really informative and he talked about how he helped people um, build resumes um, that took into account some of the ways that they volunteered and was skill-based and not um, based on kind of a continuum of time. And then also he talked about how he would actually even do um, reference checks on, um, on, this per on an individual to see what is this employer going to say and then coach. Um, coached the person he was working with on how to, how to talk to an employer about these issues so that the employer then wouldn't be blind, blindsided from a bad reference um, and was really very, very helpful. So the, the more you understand what your resources are, the stronger you're going to be in being able to make a good referral. Um, there's also some programs that will help somebody practice interviews. Um, I know, um, and you might even be able to within your tribe, um, you know, check with HR and see if the person who generally does interviews would be able to do like a come in and, and set up a schedule of mock interviews with some of the people in your program so that they have a chance to practice. Um, so they get a little less, um, little less afraid of, of going through interviews and actually get into a stronger place of talking about their own experiences. So there's a whole lot of different things that can be done with economic advocacy 
Another area is also looking at household finances. And one of the things I've heard many, many, many times is that, well, I don't do a budget because there's nothing to budget. Um, but in reality, there is something to budget. And the more you understand what, how you're spending your money is helpful in being able to understand um, the choices you make on whether you pay this bill or, or, not, or not paying another bill. Um, and there's actually a really good curriculum out there that was developed um, by the Allstate, um, Allstate Insurance and um, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I believe it was. Um, it's called the Purple Purse Curriculum, and it's on financial literacy for survivors that um, have, um, have had, you know, lived with violence and then are struggling with understanding around financial resources and, um, and takes into account the way um, financial abuse played out um, through the violence. Um, so it helps to teach people to think about money and resources in a different way when they often haven't had full control over the financial resources. Um, so it's really helpful and there's, that, it's a large curriculum and actually you can actually um, do one-to-one -one sessions from some of that information. Um, um, and there's other curricula out there as well that can be really helpful in looking at different types of economic advocacy. And, um, and then I find that it's helpful to engage people in helping to see the free activities. So, you know, finding out how to have fun in a way that doesn't cost money and how to do that with your children. Um, and taking your kids out for a little picnic to the lake or, you know, there's this, you know, territory trail days or, um, you know, the crow agency, the crow fair or something like that going on. And then you can go out and have a fun day and it doesn't necessarily cost a lot. Um, and you can, you know, go with plans on how to manage it in a way that's fairly affordable. And so all of that falls under, under doing the advocacy in a way that helps that survivor to think about their economic situation and envision how they want it to be and move toward it. And I remember one group of women I was working with one time and they were talking about, they had talked multiple times about how they really wanted to be college students. And this one day I was actually driving them to college. Um, after we had gone, we had had a meeting, there were four women, we had had a meeting with the community college and um, that day we had a tour. Um, we met with the student advisor and we met with um, the student academic advisor and then we met with financial aid. And then, um, and then in the process of, of a few meetings at the college, we, they all ended up getting enrolled into a variety of different programs. In the first week of school, I agreed that I would drive them to school every day. And so we were about midway in the week and they were still talking about how exciting it would be to be a college student and that they couldn't wait till they were a college student. And we were walking up the sidewalk to my car and I stopped and I said, so wait a minute, so where are we going today? we're going to the college um, and then I asked them I said so what are you going to do there oh we've got classes and I said so what does that mean you are and then they at the same time they said college students and they were just jumping up and up and down with joy and it was a real amazing awareness and for me it felt like a real privilege to be a part of that moment with that group of women but sometimes it's even just simple as that to put things in perspective and help them to realize the achievements they've made because they're still remembering it from before they've taken this next big step in their life. Um, and so again, as I had mentioned, being the mirror to them. So I'd like to stop now and um, see if anybody has any questions from anything that I've talked about. Um, and you can either put a question in the chat box or raise your hand.
Well, it doesn't look like there's any questions at this time, so we'll just go ahead and move forward. And, um, and if you've got questions, go, go ahead and still feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll just catch them as they come up. So um, I wanted to just briefly talk about re re relevance and resilience. So in your program, you have this period of time. Um, it's a window of opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. In somebody's life. It's a very um, precious amount of time. And um, usually in the work that we've been doing as a crisis program, um, we've had very short periods of time to have contact where we couldn't make a lot of difference. And the reality is, is that because of the length of our program, we actually have this longer period of time where we can have an impact on someone's life that can really be profound. And what's important is, is that we work in ways that connects to relevance as well as taps taps into their resilience. And, um, and so when, when I talk about re relevance, the condition of being relevant or connected with the matter at hand, is that we need to connect with what's important to that person who's sitting in front of us, to that transitional housing participant. If they don't, if they don't want anything to do with talking about going to college, then continuing to bring up college to them may not fit. Um, we might want to think about other options and look at ways that can help connect and make sense. And so if, so if you know, so they may, they may say, I just want a job, I want a nine to five, and we help them think about what that nine to five is. Um, and then, you know, like if you saw yourself five years from now, what's the job you would be doing? You know, if everything worked out, what would, what would be the job you would be doing? And, um, and then they say, you know, I think it'd be really cool to, um, you know, style somebody's hair. Um, you know, it's like, well, you know, you don't have to go to college, but you, beauty school is something that you could do. And if you'd like, I can go with you, we can make an appointment, I can take you over to a beauty college, and we can just go learn about it and talk to people about what it's like. And, and that would, that's going to connect to them in a way that's really meaningful. Um, and, as, and maybe that person is moving in that direction, but then later as you're talking, you, know, you continue to ask them to think about where would they want to be five years from now then they say, well, it would be really cool if I could run my own shop. Then you might want to start talking about that beauty school would be really good, but there's other things you might need to learn to be able to make that happen. And so there's ways to do that in pieces so it doesn't have to be this giant chunk of work in front of you. And so we want to make sure we're connecting in ways that's relevant to them. And the same thing, like as we think about what's important to them, what what inspires them, the things that they would like to see happen in their lives. But at the same time, we want to recognize that sometimes because people haven't been dreaming or imagining their life in the future, they may not be able to see something five years down the road. So that doesn't mean we stop asking the question. As I had mentioned earlier before, I want to leave them questioning. So I want to, if, she, if, they, if that person I'm working with can't say, this is what I want to do five years down the road, I want them to walk away wondering, what would I want to do five years down the road? So then I might step back and ask, so what about next year? What would you like to do next year? So I don't stop pulling them forward, but I don't push them beyond where they're ready. So it would be more relevant for us to talk in a more short-term or mid-term basis. Um, and in some cases, we may need to just look at and try to envision next month. And then, and then you know, but not stopping asking the question, but don't belabor it either. 
um, ask the question, help them, help them envision the possibilities by leaving them questioning if they can't envision it, and then moving back to where they can envision it, um, and then slowly um, moving them forward. And as I think about that, that in the work that, that you do with transitional housing, is we're walking with them. Um, and I, I envision it this way, is that when you start with somebody that's in trauma and they're just getting going, it's almost as if you are walking, you know, holding their hand and you're walking together forward, helping to lead them based on the directions they say they want to go. And at some point you let go of holding their hand, but you continue to walk beside them. And as they start to pick up their stride and walk quicker, you slowly lose pace and not walk as fast with them until they're walking on their own by themselves and they're, you know, leading the direction and everything um, that they want to go. And part of that is is that they clearly can envision their life. They clearly see that see where they're going and what they want for themselves. <clears throat> then the other piece is resilience. That um, I when we think about resilience is we want to um, connect to their capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. And so when we think about that in terms of resilience, one of the most effective, strongest resources that we have available are our indigenous ways. Our tribal ways give us a lot of ways to be resilient. Our, our tribal identity, our indigenous identity, our um, social gatherings, connecting with each other brings us strength, um, as well as our own ways of healing, whether it's basic simple ways of smudging and um, using pollen or tobacco or um, working with a spiritual person or traditional practitioner. Those are ways that are going to give us the ability to recover quickly but the, there's other things as well, um, which may be laughter and being playful. And I'm just going to share a, a short story about myself. So I came into this work as somebody who was formerly battered. And by the time I had gotten out of my marriage, I was a very shut down person. And, um, and I hardly laughed. I mean, it was hard to even get a smile out of me. And it was... It was awkward. It was a really uncomfortable place to be. And I was fortunate enough to have a few people around me that were playful. And, and I liked them. They, even though I didn't like their playfulness because it made me feel uncomfortable, um, I still liked the, you know, the rest of them and enjoyed their company and being around them. But what I found with their playfulness was it slowly pulled my playfulness out. And it slowly got me to being in a place where I could laugh and, in, and engage with other people in a humorous way. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's resilience. That's, that little bit of laughter, like one of the things that we know in terms of the way our brains function and um, the way it works in our body is that laughter helps to release endorphins. And I don't know about you all, but um, a good belly laugh, you know, really feels good when you're, when you're laughing in a really deep way. Um, and so being able to identify some of the other ways that people find resilience is really helpful. Whether it's laughter, maybe it's somebody likes to run, but they don't know how to do it with their children because, because their kids are young enough and they can't leave them alone. Um, so we want to tap into that. What are the things that can, that can help them bounce back, that can help them recover more quickly, that can um, foster some of that resilience in them? You know, whether it's that, um, you know, even being, you know, art, artful, you know, drawing, you know, like I, I see people are painting, you know, different things more and, uh, I'm not very much for art in that respect, but I can I can sure doodle pretty good, and I actually have figured out that I do some nice doodling, and when I add color to it, I feel really creative. 
um, which again is another way of using our brain, um, which is really healthy for us. So we want to think about ways to um, build resilience and build that into the, into the way we work with individuals, and even if we can, build it into the program and do it in collective ways. Because the other thing that we know about the violence is that isolation is a key part in there. And so a lot of um, survivors have lost some of their friend relationships um, and even family relationships as a result of that violent relationship. And so um, when you do group activities, you can actually foster resilience while you're also helping to address the impact of isolation and helping to build some good relationships with each other. So one, one activity that we used to do in my old organization, um, and um, we're in that time of year where you know, you're out collecting sage and sweetgrass and um, tobacco and different things like that. And so we would just organize and you know, whether it would be one participant or four participants or six, um, we would arrange it and we would go together. And even though we were all native in our organization and the people we served, some of our native participants did not know how to collect sage or sweetgrass or any of our sacred medicines. And so we took that time to teach them how to do that properly and how to use it properly, which also is a factor in building resilience to strengthen their sense of identity as well as um, how to use healing medicines. Um, so consider how you're doing that within the work of your transitional housing program. So I also want to talk a little bit about challenging issues. So our program overall um, is based on voluntary services. So as we're providing services, the key in the services are the relationships that we're building with our participants and having the conversations that slowly um, peel back the harder issues to get people ready to um, being willing to address some of the things that are hard. But in, in the work, we're going to come across a range of different challenging issues. And I, I think it's important for you to think about how do you prepare your staff for working with a population that has a range of different challenging issues as well as build the resources to access. So none of the staff need to be drug and alcohol counselors. Um, you'll end up kind of, you know, losing your focus if you're if you're if you you're, if you think you need to have a drug and alcohol counselor on staff. But you do need to have a base understanding of how to communicate about alcohol and drug issues, and um, and in that what the resources are and have the relationships with the alcohol and drug program and understand how they work so that when you're opening information up and sharing it with the participant, you're giving them accurate information and you're working in ways that are doing no harm. Um, same thing with mental health. Um, I, I know in my experience, like, uh, there's times when we're working in our program and we're saying we can only take you know, X number of families and we can't have, right now we've got a lot of heart issues going on, so we, need, we can't have any more really hard issues. And in the process of talking to people, be like, oh, wow, great, this next person, you know, they've got it together. And then they come into the program and next thing you know, they're falling apart and they've got a major mental illness that they're dealing with or even a couple major mental illnesses. And... Um, and again, we are not mental health professionals, um, but having a mental illness is not a reason to um, exclude someone from the program. Um, what we would want to do, again, as, just as we would do with alcohol and drug issues, is we would want to have the relationship 
built in such a way that uh, with the practitioners that are that are mental health professionals so that they can actually work with us on providing us in-service training to give us a foundation so that we can start to recognize we've got something bigger on our hands and how to make approaches to help help them get the help that they need um, and 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 work in partnership with the professionals to help them um, access their resources. Um, and then, you know, criminal back, you know, just as another example of a challenging issue is a criminal background history. So as someone's trying to access housing with a criminal background history, oftentimes landlords will say, no, we're not going to work with anybody with a criminal background history. Um, and you want to also um, have that relationship with your participants so that they can give you the information to say, yeah, I got arrested and was convicted of some burglaries and, you know, maybe maybe they went to prison or maybe they went to jail for a, a long period of time or something like that. And knowing that information can help you um, to work with landlords as well as identify landlords that are willing to work with people that have criminal background histories. So just because people have these challenging issues, it doesn't mean we turn them away. It really, it really puts it back to us about figuring out how to um, bring the resources together to work with them. So transitional housing, in a, in a nutshell, when we think about all the work that we're doing, we're, we're wanting to be able to make sure we, we work with existing community resources. So we're not duplicating resources. But in the process, like if we've got six households in our transitional housing program, and we know that three of them have a chemical dependency problem, maybe we'll ask the alcohol and drug program to come and do an education meeting at our women's group um, so that they can learn more about alcohol and drug and some of the resources. And it helps to open up the questions about, um, you know, is alcohol and drug a problem for you? Um, I, I remember I was working in a transitional housing program and with our staff, we were realizing we didn't recognize some of the drug paraphernalia. Um, and so we contacted the police department and those that worked on narcotics, and they had a, a narcotic kit um, that had the different kinds of current drugs that were out there and, um, and then the paraphernalia that they used. And they came and did an in-service training for us. Because the other thing, if we're meeting with that household, we can at times find ourselves in a situation to where we're seeing something that we might not even recognize as drug paraphernalia. And then, um, and actually for us, when we did that in-service training for our staff, um, went back into the office and then realized somebody had left their purse and then we reached into the purse to look for that driver's license and found a crack pipe in there, which we didn't realize. Um, we would have never recognized it as that kind of a pipe um, at that time. So, so it's important to have um, training for yourself and your staff so that you recognize um, the resources and, um, you know, and just what, what's current. You know, the reality for myself as an older woman that some of what, I, what I've known at different times has changed and our, our participants and what they do and how they communicate and how they work on or how they um, are faced with different challenges in their life looks different today than it did, say, 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. And so we need to stay current. Um, and I would encourage staff to be having in-service trainings at least on an annual basis on different issues. Um, the same thing with mental health issues, um, recognizing, um, recognizing that the prevalence of different mental health issues kind of shift a little bit over time. 
in um, the way it gets talked about and even treated changes over time as well. So had you been trained 10 years ago, it may not be the best um, practice today. Um, so we want to keep thinking about that and how to, how to insert, provide that in-service training. And so, so for me, when I think of the transitional housing program, our communities have a ton of resources within the tribe, as well as some of the resources outside of the tribal community, depending on um, how we're going to end up housing our, our families. And in doing that, we want to identify those resources and then, um, personally, I would think it would be helpful to go and introduce yourself. If you know them already, still call them up and say, you know, hey, can I come over and sit and chat with you a little bit about our program and some of how, how we can work together on this. Um, they'll, they'll benefit by understanding your program and may end up be one of your referral sources down the road, as well as, um, being able to help strengthen your capacity to do this work. So I'd like to share this poem by Joy Harjo, which is one of my favorites, um, The Blanket Around Her. Maybe it is her birth, which she holds close to herself, or her death, which is just as inseparable, and the white wind that encircles her is a part just as the blue sky, hanging in turquoise from her neck. O oh, woman, remember who you are, woman. It is the whole earth. And the reason I love this is that um, when I think about her death is that many of the people we work with have died in some way um, through the violence that they've lived with. And our work is in that process is for her to um, be able to see all of herself, not just that bad part that she lived through, but the strength that that participant experienced in their lives or live or you know demonstrates, um, and to to see themselves as a whole human being, and to see their connection to all of us. And, um, and oftentimes, the people we're working with don't. Maybe they'll see themselves as a strong person, but they may not see themselves as a gentle person. Or maybe they'll see themselves, you know, as an organized person, but may not see themselves as someone who knows how to have a lot of fun. And sometimes in the process of our engagement, um, we're going to help them to see all of that. We're going to help them to see their strengths and their weaknesses. We're going to help them to see that they have solid feet planted on the earth, and in that, that they, you know, that they can stand, that they are strong people and can walk forward from this and have a lot to offer this world. Um, and that, to me, is one of the joys of being a part of transitional housing, because we get to experience. Um, oftentimes profound change in people's lives. And then there's those occasional people that it feels like we're not making any difference. And we're working and we're patient and we're persistent and we're doing things consistently along the way, but yet it feels like we're not reaching them. And then a year or so after they've left the program, they come back and they say, wow, I just want to thank you for the difference you made in my life. And so I just want to remind everybody about this journey that we walk um, into with the participants that uh, we work with, um, that we have the potential of engaging them in really fully embracing themselves. And, um, and it's a privilege to be on that journey with them. So I just want to stop and see if there's any questions or comments that anybody would like to share. Um, as we wrap up towards the end, um, we do have our contact information on there. Um, also, you can put your question in the chat or raise your hand.
All right, if there's no questions, I'll turn it back to Hanobi. All right, I want to remind you that following the webinar, you will receive an email that contains the PowerPoint to use today. The email will also contain an evaluation form for you to share your comments about today's webinar. It is really helpful for Redwind to receive this information, and we strongly encourage you to fill it out. We'd also like to remind you about our two upcoming webinars, which will be Voluntary Tribal Transitional Housing Services, a Survivor-Centered Empowerment Approach, and that will be on the 12th next month, and that will also be Vicki. Um, and then after that, we will have Documentation to Manage Your Tribal Transitional Housing Program, and that will be on the 26th of next month. And that one, I believe, is Raquel. Um, and if you would ever like to see what webinars are coming up, you can check on our website. And it'll show at least the next two uh, most recent. Um, and if there are no other questions, Doesn't seem like there is. All right. Uh, thank you all for your time, and uh, I hope you all have a good rest of your day.